Hi, I'm here to talk to you for, uh, from the product school about the five basic statistical tests you really need to understand as a product manager. And the reason why you have to know these tests is because these are the five ways people really use data incorrectly. So as a PM, you wanna be aware of them so you can make the right decision. I'm Christopher Crosby. I'm a product manager in the core infrastructure team at Google focused on data analytics platforms. Before coming to Google, I had a few different types of roles working in both data and technology. My educational background was an undergraduate degree from Ohio University and a master's from the University of Pittsburgh. I studied information and science, information science and telecommunications, which ended up being a pretty good foundation for product management. Both the degrees, they had a focus on applying technology to real world problems, but they didn't necessarily shy away from programming or the scientific calculus that also became really invaluable. After school, I went to work building biostatistics applications for the NSABP, which is a cooperative group underneath the National Cancer Institute. I was part of a team that built software for large scale phase three clinical trials related to breast and bowel cancer. Now it was in this role that, you know, I was working as a full stack developer, but this is where I really got interested in more in like what the biostatisticians were actually doing. How are we doing this kind of data analysis? So I ended up going back to school in New York City at Hunter to get a, uh, a second master's degree, a master's of public health and biostatistics. Uh, I then took that combination of statistics and computer science and went to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I managed a data science team where we were focused on bringing new data tools and applications and making the data of uh, Sloan Kettering and the, all this cancer data research data more uh, accessible to both clinicians and researchers. I then moved into Amazon where I had a couple of roles, one of which was on a grand challenges team of Amazon, which was an organization, it was an R&D department basically, where we were tasked with coming up with new ventures for Amazon to get into. Finally, that, uh, after that, I uh, made my way over to Google where I'm currently a product manager in the data analytics uh, space. So, you know, data science and product management, it's really important. You know, data analytics, it's been important to my role. It's probably going to be important to your role too. And so, you know, in data, you know, as a product manager, you're going to have things like business analytics and metrics. You know, how many customers do you have? What's the revenue? What do your margins look like? Second, you're also going to have your product analytics. Often this comes from things like your logs analysis or a lot of the telemetry data that you're going to build into your product. To understand how users are actually using your product. When does, you know, uh, how often do they take advantage of a new feature? When does something fail? All of that. Third is you also have a lot of you know, feature testing. You might do a lot of experiments to see you know, how you want to approach a problem or a new feature or a change to your uh, recommendations. And a lot of digital native companies have gotten really good at this, doing things like A-B testing. And the product school actually has a few other great videos that talk about A-B testing specifically. And then finally, another thing that you know, you're gonna use data science for in product management is just knowing how to build the data and things like ML into your uh, applications. You know, you've seen a million you know, implementations of features for ML in different products, whether it is spam filters or smart replies, or if you're a banking application, you build fraud detection. You need to know enough about um, uh, some of the basic statistics to know how to apply these more advanced techniques to your product as well. But you know, all of that really um, is not what I'm gonna get into today. Today, I am really going to focus on just five basic statistics that you probably learned about several times starting in elementary school. So while some of it might seem redundant at first, I'm gonna do my best to explain how these five basic statistics actually apply to your role as a product manager. And so these statistics are pretty much, you know, something I use for all of my data-driven decisions. So all of those different data science use cases I just explained, these are the fundamental things that underline all of that. So let's get started. Number five, hypothesis testing. Now this is an act in statistics whereby an analyst will test an assumption using a very specific methodology. Now the methodology depends on the nature of the data used and the reason for the analysis, but the hypothesis testing is used to assess the plausibility. And you know, you have sample data. You don't necessarily have the entire world of data, you have samples. So product managers, you know, this is what we do. We need to become experts at coming up with hypotheses and then rigorously, rigorously testing them. As a PM, you don't want to be the guy with just another, or a guy or girl with just another opinion in the room. You want to be the person with the validated hypothesis. Now, you want to test your product assumptions about 
everything. And this is not just A-B testing. So one way PMs do this hypothesis testing is we come up with really well-scoped MVPs that define a very specific hypothesis that we want to go and validate in the product. Now, the approach to MVP, that really has to change based on what you want to test. For example, there's an MVP known as the RAT, or the reasonable assumption, or the riskiest assumption test. And this is a great way you can go and test, you know, the thing about the product that I'm not sure if it's going to work, you know, I go and just test that. There's also ways to test, you know, a product market fit overall without having to build the full product first. So a popular approach is something like coming up with a, a concierge MVP, where, you know, maybe ideally you would have this whole system automated, but first you want to test if people would even use that. A famous example of that is when Zappos got started. Zappos originally, um, you know, was not all automated. It was people taking pictures of shoes, posting them, then going out and getting those shoes, but it really proved the market fit so then they could expand on the technology section. Lots of opportunities to do that. Even another approach that's similar is taking a lot of people's products that already exist, wrapping those up, and then seeing if that works for your um, tester market fit. So that's something known as an OPP or other people's product MVP. But the way to approach, you know, what you really want to do with all of this is just, you know, with, when you test hypotheses, is, is make sure that you are using your customer feedback to validate your hypothesis. So I often hear the job of the PM is that, you know, talk to customers or be the voice of the customer. But the problem with that is in most companies today that are customer focused, everyone talks to the customer. So when it comes to put in feature requests, everyone has opinions. You know, customer service has a list of friction points that customers have hit. Engineering, they've talked to customers about scaling issues and they want to implement those. Marketing, they talk to customers about maybe future needs or business fit. What needs to separate the PM from all this noise is that your, the PM can bring validated hypotheses that have actually been tested with the methodology. So you want to be very thoughtful about how you talk to customers and what you want to actually validate. So you can do that by you know, formulating in a real study plan. You can know what hypotheses you're actually trying to test ahead of time and then know what you're trying to get out of it. And then you want to make sure that you're asking a lot of open-ended questions to give your customer chances to um, you know, talk about their pain points and understand their business better. And that way you're not just biasing with, you know, with various, you know, biasing them with the few things that you already think that they want. So Cindy Alvarez wrote a book on lean customer development where she gives some great open-ended questions that have worked for me almost universally in everything that I've researched. So things like, you know, tell me about how you do blank, whatever you're, you're trying to study today. Or do you have, you know, uh, do you use any X, any tools to help you get, you know, this process done? Uh, if you could wave a magic wand, like, what would you do? And you say, you know, forget about, you know, what's possible, just what would you want to get done? And you can come up with solutions based around that. And then last time you did whatever you're studying, you know, what were you doing right before? And then maybe what were you doing right after? And then, you know, is there anything about, you know, always end with, is there anything about this subject that I, you know, should have asked? Now, this doesn't mean that every conversation you have with a customer is going to be this, you know, open-ended conversation exploring their workflow. You still have sales pitches, technical troubleshooting, but these are the type of open-ended questions that you could and should be incorporating into those conversations. Every customer interaction could be treated as an opportunity to either confirm or deny a hypothesis that you have about your product or service. Uh, definitely uh, recommend Cindy Alvarez's book if you want to go deeper on this subject. She has a very short read, but a very great read on you know how to actually go and do data-driven you know hypothesis testing uh, with your customers and these get that and get that level of detail you need out of the customer conversation. So. The next test I'm going to talk about, which is more of a you know, traditional statistical test, is a t-test. And this is probably one of the most common statistical tests I wish was presented next to a claim that some salesperson, PM, or engineer makes. Um, to help me explain exactly what this is, I'm just going to walk through an example. So I can't tell you how often it happens that you have you know, some engineer that comes to you and says, like, hey, my new feature, it increases customer revenue by $105 per customer. And then they have something like the spreadsheet to the right, where there are users with and without the feature. And now I know a lot of digital native companies, they do this the right way with proper control groups and A-B testing, but not every decision that you're gonna make is, you know, can have that rigor and can be made that way. So for example, like one thing that you know, comes up for me pretty often is when I'm trying to price a new feature, you know, I have to rely on um, you know, 
data that I can build. I can't A-B test customers on pricing. So like one time, you know, I was trying to price a new tiering feature and I had to decide, you know, if there should be an increase in consumption or not. And we have to look at data and you really want to make sure you have, you know, valid, you know, um, a valid analysis before you make these kinds of decisions. So, you know, back to my example here, you know, the uh, engineer brings me this spreadsheet. And of course, you know, it looks like the one on the right, whenever I get this, uh, all I do, first thing, I always just go and I run a t-test. It usually just takes a couple minutes. It's a fun, it's, you look, uh, you know, this is the actual function that you would call in a Google Sheet. And what it does is it not only takes the mean, but also the standard deviation of those means. So that tells you how much fluctuation there is in the data and how reliable is it that the two populations are actually, you know, more the same or they're different. So, you know, in that spreadsheet example, what I do is I put that t-test in and then it spits out a p-value, which is a basically the chance that this occurred, by ch or the probability that this occurred by chance. So in this case, there's almost a 70% chance that that $105 per customer result occurred by chance. Now, typically you want less than 0 0.05 or a 5% chance that something occurred uh, for it to be statistically significant. So in this case, you know, I can just, you know, dismiss that $105. It's just not statistically true. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as you go about, you know, doing these t-tests is it is for uh, more or less linear data, things like, you know, money or uh, uh, it works well for. But if you have counts, something in a bucket uh, that you're counting, you know, you're definitely, or you know, anything that's categorical, um, you definitely want to run a chi-squared test, not a t-test. That's also a mistake I've also, you know, often seen made. Okay, number three. By far, the most popular technique in statistics is regression. It's the basis for a ton of machine learning. And, uh, and so it's certainly worth understanding in a lot more detail than I'm going to provide in this, uh, you know, in this webinar today. Because, you know, when it comes to putting machine learning in your product and knowing what it can and can't do, an understanding of basic regression and all of its various limitations, it's probably the, if you study regression, that's probably the biggest return on investment you're going to get. So there's just countless new ML algorithms coming out every day, but a lot of them all come down to basic regression techniques. So if you have a deep understanding of regression, that's going to help you not only come up, you know, with interesting product features, uh, and then you don't have to just speculate based on like, some science fiction novels that you've read about what machine learning can and can't do. So what's your, uh, you know, just it's a level set, you know, if you have not come across it before, what you're looking at is regression at its most basic form. This is a standard, you know, linear regression. In this case, we're comparing, um, you know, cricket chirps versus the temperature, and you can see that they are completely correlated. That line, that is your regression model. The red points are just data points. A trick that is very popular that most people play is, you know, if you have a binary outcome, either your customer clicked or they did not click, you know, and it's, uh, you know, one or the other, you can take that same regression, you can, uh, and plot that between zero and one. And what that outputs is a probability that, hey, that, of what that, uh, of what that, uh, you know, click rate is going to be. Uh, again, this is just barely scratching the surface of what you would want to know about regression. But if you want to go more uh, into this, and I recommend uh, a machine learning crash, co crash course that Google puts out. It's totally free. It's a great way to get deeper into both regression, but also just some general machine learning techniques that will really help you if you want to better understand, um, you know, how you can apply uh, machine learning to your product. Number two. The number two on my list is ARIMA, which is a statistical technique you typically, typically want to use for working with time series data. Things like predicting customer churn, setting monthly sales quota, capacity planning for resources over the years. All these are time series analysis, which often gets put on the product manager. And the way they're typically done is painfully wrong. So I know it might feel like I'm skipping ahead about 20 chapters going from things like t-test and regression to an autoregressive integrated moving average. But I do feel like it's super important for PMs to be aware, at least, of this type of statistical modeling, especially since estimations about near future often have lots of big repercussions if you get them wrong. So my goal here isn't to necessarily have you come away with the capability to run a rock-solid ARIMA model, 
but rather I want you to remember the concept so that when you are doing your monthly revenue projections or some other very important estimation for the business, you at least know to go do some research or ask for help. So the mistakes I see people make when modeling predictions on time range from very simple things. So maybe you're selling pumpkins and your sales have been going up all of October and November. Then your VP goes, hey, can you predict the annual recurring revenue, the ARR, you know, and you just take that November revenue, you multiply it out, multiply it out by 12, and then you say, hey, that's my recurring revenue for next year. And then you ignore not, you know, all that seasonality and you're completely going to miss your sales targets because your model didn't correctly capture the seasonality when you ran that prediction. Now, even when I do see seasonality taken into account, seasonality often does not tell the complete story. This is where the benefit of like an ARIMA model and decomposition modeling comes in. Now, the example I'm showing here is actually not an ARIMA model per se, but it is demonstrating how a time series analysis can be done by breaking out the various components of what goes into the data, things like seasonality. And so here you can see I took a beer production data set. You see it broken into a time, you know, it's based on time on the left. And then on the right, you can see how it's broken into its various elements, like the seasonality versus the actual trend. So ARIMA models, they take this even a step further and try to describe the autocorrelations in the data, data as well. Now, if I've piqued your interest into learning more about correctly building time series models, there are a couple good places to start. One is R, the programming language, and the other, uh, statistical programming language. The other is Google BigQuery. So if you're willing to write a small amount of R code, it's quite easy to get started with an ARIMA model. If you have data at the quarterly or monthly level, a suits decomposition is an easy way to get more insights in your time series data. You can find that and a lot of other simple time series functions in this seasonal R package. Now, ARIMA itself can get quite complex. It has just a lot of options, but there's also a forecast library in R that contains this auto.arima function, and that follows best statistical practices to find the right way to analyze your data. Now, like all things automated, you definitely should be cautious of the output and validate with what you know against your data and your business. But a lot of statisticians you know, do rely on this function. Another option is actually the product I, one of the products I work on, Google BigQuery, which is Google's cloud-based data analysis platform. That has ARIMA models built in, and we, you actually get a free you know, terabyte of processing each month to use. And then there's even public data sets available so you can practice your modeling on some data that Google has made available for you without having to load up anything. If you want to go deeper into this subject, a book I recommend is Forecasting Principles and Practice. This is a little bit heavier of a read. It was, it's, I think it's designed as a, like a kind of an MBA uh, level book. So it is approachable in its math, but you know, you should, you know, if you're going into this, you should expect to, you know, open up uh, R a little bit and get in there. All right, this brings us to number one. Number one is average, because this is the one that is used in the most misleading ways. So always be a lookout whenever someone, you know, talks about the average. And, you know, you should know when you're talking about median, mean, and standard deviation, standard deviation from that mean. So mean means the most, this is the most common approach. This is all the numbers added up and divided. This is the same way you got grades in school. But the mean, that can hide a lot of information. Let's say you're trying to understand the average wealth of an Amazon employee. So you go to the cafeteria and you ask everyone their wealth as they walk in. There's about 100 people in the room. But then Jeff Bezos walks into the cafeteria and says, oh, you know, 180 billion. So, you know, does that mean that, you know, everyone at Amazon is a billionaire? You know, no. You're, you know, this average can be really misleading. So this sounds intuitive, but PMs do this all the time. They make the mistake constantly. They have one or two whales, you know, big customers who drive up the overall averages in their product. And then they claim that this is, you know, the, how the average person uses their product. And I've seen this hidden in a lot of metrics too. PMs might talk about, you know, the customer acquisition cost or LTV based on some average revenue. But, you know, you might only have one or two whales that completely skew all those metrics and make it sound like, you know, this is this fantastic product market fit, but then the average, and the average customer is spending all this money. But in reality, if you just had like, you know, it might just be one company that are doing some tests. And then when that company walks away from the product, you know, all those awesome metrics, they just vanish. So the median, that will tell you the actual middle. 
This is more often what you want. It's less common, but typically it's a lot more useful. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of examples where the median does not work either. For example, the median of my cloud product having an outage, that's about zero. Now, my recommendation to customers is, hey, still set up disaster recovery to failover because there is this off chance that can happen. But, you know, so that's where the median isn't that useful. But also, like, maybe if you're in a consumer business, especially one if you have, like, a subscription fee for it, the median doesn't really matter at all because everyone's pretty much paying the same. The general rule here is that you want a fair reflection of the data, and that is really hard to come up with fat, hard and fast rules for. But hopefully you kind of remember this presentation, and the next time you hear the word average, that should trigger you to start thinking about the right follow-up questions that you want to go and ask. So the last book I'm going to recommend today, it's a great follow-up if you did want to learn more about basic statistical principles. Uh, it's called What is a P-Value Anyways? And it was written by a top statistician that I used to work with at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, Dr. Vickers. And he used this book to train medical students on what they needed to know about statistics to do their research. And it gives some great, really funny examples of basic statistical techniques that make it easy to kind of understand and remember how they all work. So if you want to know more about how to use data in your job, this is definitely the book to go check out. So with that, I appreciate your time and uh, hope some of this was useful. Uh, I am on LinkedIn and feel free to reach out directly. We'd love to chat more. Thanks.